Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hello, wildlings. Everyone can respect a good hustle, right? We're always told that those who can, do, and that there is that one person in every community who becomes a pillar by doing whatever is needed for those in need. Well, today's truly traumatizing tale is even better. Our protagonist is doing it for love and a healthy chunk of change. Happy Valentine's Day, folks. Tonight's story, Valentine's Day by creepypasta notable Christopher Maxim. There are some links below to his business site as well as his Reddit page for the story script. Enjoy! I graduated from high school a few years back. I still live with my parents, but I'm using this time to my advantage. They're kind enough not to charge rent and that allows me the ability to save up almost every penny I make. The hope is that I can one day start up a small but legitimate business and move into my own apartment. You know, the American dream. You see, much to my parents' dismay, I don't have a steady job. I prefer to take a do-it-yourself approach and be my own boss. I buy and resell things online and take up odd jobs here and there to supplement my income. I buy and resell things online and take up odd jobs here and there to supplement my own income. With the help of social media and Craigslist, I'm able to regularly mow lawns in spring and summer, rake leaves in autumn, and shovel driveways in winter. Eventually, I figure I'll have enough to buy a decent car and reach clients outside of town, maybe even hire a few lackeys. What I'm here to share with you, however, is an incident that occurred nearly two years ago now. One that, uh, one that keeps me on edge to this day. My first year in business, I introduced a flower delivery service. Uh, depending on the season, I'd either pick flowers from around town or buy them from the local florist, then deliver them to a person of my client's choosing. Though it wasn't my most popular service, it did bring in some good money. You'd be surprised at how much folks are willing to pay to woo a loved one with plants. <laughs> in all that time that I biked flowers back and forth from person to person, I only ever picked up one regular. His name was Red, and he was absolutely infatuated with his girlfriend, Clara. Once a month, I would deliver a dozen roses to the local hotel where she worked. No matter how many times I went over there with the same bouquet, she always acted surprised and delighted to no end. They really did have something special, and I was happy to be part of their lives, at least in some small way. But then, February rolled around. Albeit my least popular odd job, I do gain a little traction during the Valentine's season. Along with the additional customers, Red goes all out and has me deliver three bouquets on the week leading up to the holiday. Between these deliveries and keeping up with my usual services, February beats the living hell out of me. Uh, this particular Valentine's week was a little different. It was getting close to the big day, and I hadn't received a single order from Red. I usually don't get attached to my clients, but I was quite fond of Red and Clara. Because of this, I decided to reach out to him. I tried calling him. No dice. Nothing but dial tones and voicemail. I thought about riding over to the hotel to ask Clara about it, but that might have cut into the rest of the work that I had lined up for that day. With no viable options available to me, I simply went about my day and kept a positive mindset. Something felt off, but I was sure that it was nothing to worry about. The next day, Red called back. He was fine, but there was something that he wanted to discuss with me. Of all the phone conversations that I've ever had, this one tops the list for most bizarre. Red hadn't ordered any flowers, because he was getting ready to pop the question to Clara. 
He wanted the lack of gifts that week to have her confused and then catch her completely off guard on Valentine's Day by asking for her hand in marriage. I was happy for them, but that's when the conversation took an unexpected turn. Red didn't have a ring. He was wealthy, he could afford whatever jewelry he wanted, but not just any engagement ring would suffice. He wanted his mother's ring, the one that his father proposed to her with. It was the only one that he felt was fitting, the only one worthy enough to be wrapped around Clara's finger. There was just one problem. His mother was buried with it. And then came the weird part. Red offered me $10,000 cash to dig up his mother's grave and retrieve the ring from her dead finger. He said that he would do it himself, but he didn't have the nerve. He couldn't bring himself to defile her gravesite like that. He wasn't exactly comfortable with me doing it either, but he truly felt that this was the only way that he could propose to his one true love. I pleaded with the guy. I really did. I told him to go to Jared's. I mean, women love rings from Jared's. Seriously. But alas, he wouldn't budge on the matter. And whether it was the allure of money that I could use to expand my business or the desire to help out a desperate friend in need, I grudgingly accepted the job. I'm not going to make any excuses here. I know you think I'm crazy for doing it, and yes, I most certainly was. I know this now. Hell, I knew it then too, but have you ever looked back on something you did in your past and wondered, what the hell was I thinking? Well, this is one of those moments for me. And try as one might, you can't go back and change the stupid shit you've done. This is something I'll just have to live with. Under the light of a full moon, I biked over to the cemetery. As conspicuous as the shovel protruding from my backpack looked, I managed to make it the whole way out there without any trouble. After passing the black entrance gates, I laid my bike down and set out on foot. The graveyard was consumed by a late winter chill and an uneasy silence. My footsteps cut through the crisp night air, creating echoes that danced from headstone to headstone. I turned back from time to time and told myself it was to check for passing cars but really I was afraid of ghosts lurking in the shadows. I never really believed in them, but being surrounded by hundreds of buried corpses in the middle of the night can really do a number on your psyche. Growing more nervous with each passing moment, I trotted to the back of the cemetery in haste. My hurried pace was soon impeded by a fresh pile of white marble upon which was etched the name Abigail Grovewood in a stunningly elegant font. This was Red's mother right where he said she'd be. It was time to get down to business. In the hopes of saving at least a little bit of face, I will say that in this moment, what I was doing did feel deeply wrong on a moral level. I was about to vandalize and rob the grave of a deceased stranger. She didn't deserve this, and I very well knew it. How would I live with myself knowing that I had disturbed her peaceful slumber? That question had a simple answer. With $10,000 in my pocket, that's how. I'd come too far to turn back, and I foolishly felt that this was the best way to further my financial endeavors at the time. May God have mercy on my soul. The whole process only took about six and a half hours, a little less time than I had really expected. I suppose shoveling driveways every year prepared me for this pivotal yet strange moment in my life. After all was said and done, I looked at the coffin below and panted profusely. Despite being utterly exhausted, I had no time to waste. Daylight was on its way, and I had to get the hell out of Dodge before it exposed the land of the dead here. With how narrow the hole was, there was no way that I could open up the coffin by conventional means. Adding insult to injury for poor Abigail, I had to use my shovel to break through the confines of her deathbed. Eventually, I desecrated the entire cover, allowing me ample room to 
retrieve the ring no matter which hand it ended up being on. Victory was within reach. Psst. Before taking my prize, I looked at the woman that I was about to steal from. The sight of her corpse was a grotesque one. She had only been buried for about a year, so the flesh hadn't fully decayed yet. It sat on her skin like batter on an uncooked drumstick. To top it off, the maggots crawled around every inch of her surface. It was sickening. Just as I was about to reach past the flesh-eating bugs and grab Abigail's hand, something crazy happened. It was dark, that's for sure, but I swear I saw her begin to sit up in her grave. The movement was subtle, but it was enough for me to take notice. I was startled, but it took a few seconds for the gravity of the situation to sink in. When it did, I became so spooked that I hightailed it out of there without a second thought. And that's the gist of my late night adventure. Pretty lame, right? Went through all of that grief just to chicken out at the last minute? Yeah, pathetic, I know, but you weren't there to experience it. As I climbed out of the hole, I thought I felt something brush against my ankle. Perhaps Abigail's brittle hands attempting to pull me to my death. As I ran to my bike, I pictured her crawling up from her earthly tomb and chasing me down the road until I was inevitably captured. This was the single most frightening night of my life. I was scared shitless, and I didn't give a flying fuck about Red or the 10,000 bucks. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. Of course, upon arriving home, logic set in, and I realized the error of my ways. It was entirely possible that Abigail was as still as stone, and I only thought I saw her move. What I felt against my ankle was more than likely maggots crawling up my pant leg. I'd let the eerie atmosphere of the cemetery get the better of me, and now I was out ten grand and a good friend. Just my goddamn luck. I almost went back, but the sun was beginning to rise. I couldn't risk being spotted and going to jail, though that was a likely outcome regardless. Instead, I wallowed in self-pity and ignored Red's calls for a couple of days. Soon enough... My failed grave robbery was all over the news. But here's the thing. When the police discovered my handiwork, something was profoundly amiss. Abigail's casket was empty. And so, kids, the moral of the story is you may not want the world to mess with your relationships, your precious feelings, your need for acceptance and love, but that doesn't mean you get to dismiss and defile those around you, even if they are dead. Stay scary, my wildlings. Be ready for backlash if you steal from those who came before, and make the most of your nights.